Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, would you please open them up to Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 2, as we continue our series that we started a few months ago, Biblical Romance. Now, last week we, we dealt with the hot uh, subject of sex, which the church probably needs to be talking more and more about because in our silence, we're definitely losing the battle of our sexuality. But still, today's subject, uh, conflict, is actually more difficult issue for many of us to deal with. If you're married, you've had conflict. Uh, for some couples, uh, it pretty much right in the beginning, from day one, it started. For others, you know, like Holly and I, uh, we were friends and dated and were engaged for over five years and never once had a fight, never had any kind of conflict. And then about a week after our honeymoon, we had our first fight. And to be honest, because of that, it was a bit shocking, kind of came out of nowhere, didn't really know what to do. As I said before, when I talked about it, um, I know it had something to do with the dishes. That's all I remember. I'm sure Holly could give you every detail, and since then I've learned that I was wrong. But the point is, it's not if it happens, but when it happens. And it can either be very healthy, actually taking your marriage to the next level of intimacy, or it can be incredibly miserable, getting to a point that you can't even be in the same room with one another uh, without fighting all depending on how you handle conflict. Now, real quick sidestep so that we all understand. There's a misnomer out there that, uh, that a healthy marriage is one that never has conflict, that healthy couples never fight. So let me let you in on a secret in case you didn't know. That's not true. In fact, the reality is marriages that never fight, couples that never have any kind of conflict are most likely two people that are just cohabitating. Uh, a couple that doesn't really talk much, couples that don't share their opinions because it's when you share opinions where you'll have differences and there'll at least be some level of conflict. And so the end, couples that don't really know each other very well. Uh, there's a, a relationship marriage expert named Gary Smalley. He talks about the idea that in any relationship, friendship, marriage, whatever, there's five levels of communication. Level one, he calls cliche. It's here where there's no forethought, genuine intent. It's a conversation that you might have with a you know, grocery store clerk. How are you doing today? Fine. The second level of communication is facts. It's where we you know, talk about weather, office, directions, pick up the dry clean. For Holly and I, it's kind of like a scheduling, schedule meeting every day. Who's got what kid to which event, right? I mean, it's kind of how it works. With no real in-depth thinking or feeling. But then at some point in time, even when we are talking about facts, we move into the third level of communication, and that is opinions. Uh, this is where we share concerns, expectations, goals, dreams, desires. You may have heard this before, but the Chinese symbol for risk has two symbols. One is danger, and the other one is opportunity. And this is that point in our relationship when we begin to share our opinions that there is danger and there is great opportunity. The fact of the matter is we talk about this a lot here, uh, especially in this, this series, that uh, you and your spouse are very different. You're different for a lot of reasons. You're different because of your personalities. You're different because past experiences. You're different because simply you're a man and a woman. Therefore, you have different perspectives. And it's because of all this that you then at level three opinions, you will hit what he calls the wall of conflict. Now, the reason why it's important, number one, not to just avoid conflict, and then number two, learn how to deal with it in a healthy way, is because he argues it's actually through the wall of conflict that you're able to go into the fourth level, and that's feelings. It's when you both, using healthy habits of conflict, feel safe to share your opinion, to, to share your concerns, to share your emotions, it's then that you begin to get deeper and deeper, and then you move into level five, which he calls needs, when you're able to share your unique needs, your unique, unique desires. This is the deepest level of love and intimacy that we all want to experience. But the fact of the matter is we almost always have to go through the wall of conflict to get there. The reason why a message like this is so important is if you avoid conflict or you don't have the right skills to move through that wall, what happens is a lot of couples, instead of moving through it to the deepest level of intimacy, couples often just revert to the first three uh, levels over and over again, therefore never truly knowing one another, therefore not knowing how to meet each other's needs that they desire to be met. And then it leads you down a road that nobody wants to go. It's just slowly but surely, a little wedge, and you get further and further apart 
to maybe to separation and divorce, or maybe sometimes you're just feeling alone in, in your opinion in a loveless marriage. Now, as I said before, when we're looking at the book of Song of Solomon, it's like a snapshot of what this relationship ought to look like ideally. It's kind of like the perfection of this relationship. Yet even in this great example of a perfect marriage, we have conflict. And Song of Solomon shows us not only the reality of it, but it shows us that it's really important to learn how to deal with it because it leads us to deeper levels of intimacy. In fact, next week as we close our series, we're looking at deepening, how we can move beyond this and have deeper levels of intimacy and friendship, what we're really all uh, looking for. So as we begin in chapter 5, verse 2, I'm going to do kind of like we did last week. We're going to read through the passage, allow God to teach us as we read, make some points along the way, and then come back at the end with some practical insights uh, so that we can move through conflict, use it as a door to deeper intimacy, not a wall that you're just hitting each other against over and over again. Now, if you're with us last week, the last time we saw our couple, they are, experience, they are experiencing or have just experienced an incredible first time together. It was hot. It was passionate. Verse 1 of chapter 5, uh, God looks down on their sexual experience and he blesses it. He says it's good because it's in the context of marriage. He says, eat, O oh friends, drink, drink your fill, O oh lovers. He applauds them and tells them to enjoy. And then the very next verse in our book, right after this incredible experience, we see conflict spark. Seemingly out of nowhere, but if you've been around the block for a little while, you know that conflict never comes from nowhere. Even if it feels like it in the moment, it always comes from something before that moment. But when we see that conflict spark in any relationship, it can be in marriage, what we're talking about, but in any other relationship as well, anytime we see that conflict spark, every person has a choice. Every person, you're really holding two buckets. One is water, which is meaning you've really learned what conflict is and you've learned how to handle it in a proper way and you can kind of put it on the conflict and move you to deeper levels of intimacy. The other bucket you hold is gasoline. And you could throw it on that spark and have a barn burner right there. Let's dive in. Verse two, she says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Then he says, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew. He's outside knocking on the door. My hair is in the dampness of the night. Now, although it's hard to catch in just one verse, especially in poetry, as we read the whole passage, we see it come to light that she's gone to bed upset with him. We don't know what he's done. We don't know what he said, if it's his fault or not. But he has come to reconcile. So he comes to the door and he knocks. And if you're a married man, you've experienced this before. She's inside the door. You come up to it and you knock. It's kind of like sheepishly, hey, baby. Can we have a conversation? Can we talk? Verse three, she says, I've taken off my robe, must I put it on again? I have washed my feet, must I soil them again? Essentially, she says, go away. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't wanna deal with this issue anymore, let alone you. I'm in bed, I'm tired, I've resolved to be mad. If you make me get out of this bed and put that robe back on and get my feet cold, boy, it's gonna get worse. So that spark is flashed right in front of him. How's he gonna handle it? Well, again, he has choices. I'm going to use two words today, and they can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but let me define what I mean for conflict, what I mean for us today. The first word is you can react. Uh, react, what I, how I'm using that term is that you're allowing your response to be led by your flesh. You're allowing your response to be led by maybe what is the natural thing you want to come out. The second way we can uh, move into this situation is to respond. React, respond. Respond. <clears throat> excuse me, is when we're led by the Spirit. So he has choices. He could do what we have all probably done on one level or another, bang on the door, let me in, yell, be upset, which obviously will not go over well. It's throwing gasoline on the spark. Yet, I would argue that all of us, at one point in time or another, at one level or another, have gone in that mode. And you know how it is. You're in that moment. You know you shouldn't say it or whatever it might be, like this young one, and that's how we respond. And, and what, what ends up happening is you know you shouldn't, but you do it anyway. There's something in us. What are the dangers of reacting? I want to give you three real quick dangers of reacting. Number one, it's hard to be angry and not sin. Ephesians 4 says, in your anger, do not sin. 
Anger in of itself is not a sin. It's an emotion that you cannot control. But often what we do and say out of our anger is. I can say I honestly don't believe there's been a time in my life that I've ever said anything out of my anger and looked back and thought, wow, that was a profound thought. I need to write that down. I need to put it on Facebook. I need to share it with my growth group, maybe even share it with the church because it's so enlightening. In reality, it's the opposite. And so the danger in reacting into anger is we often let that first instinct within to be the first thing that comes out, and it often is sin. And then the problem with this is now the actual issue that probably still needs to be resolved isn't the issue any longer. It's you and your sin. Now, for those of you who don't know me, it might come to be a surprise. I don't know. For those who do know me, it's not. And that is, uh, I'm a bit of a hothead. Always have been. Uh, And, you know, it's interesting as I look at my anger over the years, my explosions of outrage have almost always, for years and years and years, they'd only come out in two places. They'd come out in sports, uh, playing them, but more so watching them. (laughs) And then secondly, they'd they'd come out in home improvement projects, pretty much the thorn of my flesh. You know, Holly was actually surprised in our premarital counseling when this kind of came out as part of my DNA. We got married, and I'm telling you, I I never, ever yelled at Holly, ever. I mean, partly because I'm afraid of her, but the, (laughs) it's just, it's not something that was in, it it was normal for me. But then something about 11 years ago changed. Want to take a guess? We had kids, and it's like everything changed. I don't know about you, for me it's incredibly frustrating that these three little human beings that I love more than anybody on earth are pretty much the only people that I've ever yelled at. But you know, it's interesting because when I do this, and I do it more than I should, it's in that moment that the actual issue, and and I'm not trying to be funny here, with my kids, 99% of the time when I'm having a frustration with them, I am right. I'm trying to teach them something, and it's it's not a joke. 99% of the time, I am right. But what happens when I get angry and I begin to yell or or overreact or whatever it might be, the issue right then really is unsolvable because now it's more about me and my reaction. Marriage is very similar. When you react in anger, and sometimes it even leads us to sin, that issue needs to be resolved, but now it's no longer about the issue. It's about you and your sin. And the problem is the issue goes unresolved. And even if you make up, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you too, the issue's still lying there. It wasn't dealt with and it will come back. Secondly, when we react, you lose perspective. You know, when you take a step back, sometimes we use very polarizing language in conflict, such things as you always do that, you never take care of it. Every time I say this, you do that. Really? I mean, every time, always, the problem with this is very accusatory language, finger pointing. And when we're doing that, hardly ever resolution comes. Then thirdly, and most importantly, if you catch nothing else, and when we react, we often lose the concept of oneness. I tell you, when we lose the concept that you are on the same team, and somehow now you're on opposing sides, game over, you both lose. What happens in that moment is now it's about pride, it's about being right, it's about winning, it's no longer about the issue When we lose the perspective that when she wins, I win, and vice versa, it's a very uh, difficult prospect for our relationship. We must understand that you can actually apologize, say you're right, I'm wrong, and that can be a win for both of you. Because then pride's not the issue, being right isn't the issue, winning isn't the issue. We, as a team, winning, moving forward, that becomes the issue. So in these moments, we need to learn how to respond, not react. Again, be driven by the Holy Spirit. When that conflict sparks in front of us, there's that initial, "Mm," to be able to, over time, learn how to take that breath and lean into God. Lord, I know this is an issue. I have an opportunity to blow it up, but God, would you you give me your strength to, in the moment, not make this about me, but respond as you like me to. And as soon as you begin to defer Give up you to the Holy Spirit. Over time, what you're going to see is the fruit of the Spirit begin to actually be displayed in your life. By the way, that is where you need the fruit of the Spirit is in conflict. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Man, it's easy to display the fruit of the Spirit when everything's going well. I gotta, I'm really self-controlled and gentle and kind when everything's great. It's in conflict. That, that needs to be displayed. 
You know, I don't think I've ever had a conflict with Holly that I, that I deferred to the Holy Spirit that it then escalated. I never caused her to go berserk because I was selfless, peaceful, gracious, loving, and kind. We need to allow the Spirit to be in control. Now, some of the benefits of these, besides the obvious, number one, when we respond this way, it preserves the oneness of marriage. Secondly, it allows God to work on your spouse instead of you. When you respond, God, lead me in this moment, you're allowing God to work in your spouse's heart. When you are trying to work in your spouse's heart and lead them to what you think is the godly response, you've, you've taken God out of the equation. When you step back and let God be God, it's amazing how many times he gets to the matters of the heart. Thirdly, it keeps things in perspective. For those who are married, I mean, have you ever had a conflict, maybe even a big one that lasted an hour, a day, a week, two weeks, and you look back and sometimes you're thinking, what are we even arguing about? I don't really remember. How'd this start? Or maybe you know exactly what it was, but when you really get to the heart of the matter, it really isn't that big of a deal. The point is when we respond instead of react, we can avoid a lot of unhealthy conflict. And then what you're able to do is use the energy that you do have to work on the actual issue, because we all have them. We all have differences of opinions in marriage, and when we're able to handle it in a healthy way, we actually save that energy to move forward on that issue as a team. So we're going to watch this guy respond. Again, there's conflict. He's at the door. He has knocked. Verse 4, she says, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening, and my heart began to pound for him. You know, he doesn't yell. He doesn't go berserko. It's not like he's physically putting his hand through the door. That's not what it's saying. It's an imagery. It's an olive branch. As we see in the passage, he actually gives her some space. Instead of reacting, he responds and gives her some room. And because of his godly response, it says her heart pounds for him. When in anger, we react, we get angry, the only thing that pounds is more anger. She's responding to his godly initiative. Verse 5, she says, I rose to open for my lover and my hands dipped with myrrh. It goes on to talk about myrrh there for a couple verses. And the, the key there is they have used this word myrrh as a symbol of their love from the very beginning of Song of Solomon. So in the midst of conflict, it's used again because of how he has responded. Because he responds in the Holy Spirit, he, it reminds her of his faithfulness, who this guy really is, even though there's a disagreement, how faithful he's been, great character in dating and courtship into it now. Because of this, she says in verse 6 and 7, I have opened my lover. My lover had left. He is gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but did not answer. Then it says, the watchmen found me. As they made their rounds in the city, they beat me. They bruised me. They took away my cloak. Now, this is imagery. And what it's saying here is it's not this physical thing that's happening. It's because he's responded in the Holy Spirit and he's allowing God to work that something's now happening inside of her. She's confronted, convicted by God, not him. Notice how she responds. We're going to look at it. She's a godly, humble woman. And again, for all the single people in the room, this is a major reason why I would highly encourage you to seek after a person of godly character, because you're going to have conflict with your spouse. You need to find someone who will submit to the word of God, submit to the authority of Christ, or it's very difficult to, for them to respond. Very difficult for them to be quick to apologize, quick to seek reconciliation, submit, quick to submit to God. Oftentimes, even if you respond well, because they don't have the spirit of God in their life, they will still react. So, she sees her wrong, verse 8. She says, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if you find my lover, will you tell him, tell him I'm faint with love. And so this goes all the way back to chapter 2. She is in love with him and it, to a point where it, she wanted to physically express it. And the point I'm making is right here in the middle of conflict, because he's handling it well, it rekindles a passion of love for him. In fact, 10 through 16, I don't have time to read it all, she expresses how awesome he is. In the middle of conflict, she says, in the middle of conflict, my lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. And she spends six verses talking about how great this guy is. In fact, it's the first time in the whole book that she expounds on how awesome he is. Seems like an odd time for this inter interjection, but it's not. Because of character, because he's handled conflict with godliness, 
it causes her to respond with sensitivity, tenderness, and affirmation. For everyone in the room who's had a kind of a, a, a fight with their spouse, think about the last time and how you handled it. How do you think your spouse would describe you afterwards? Would they say, man, after that fight, I was faint with love? <laughs> Maybe not. It really depends on how you handle it. I want you to notice in the midst of this conflict, though, she feels secure. She feels safe. She doesn't think he's going to leave. She's not get divorced. She's not afraid that he won't accept her apology because there's a track record of faithfulness. In fact, at the end of 16, when she's describing him, she says, this is my lover, this is my friend. Again, she's expounding on the fact we are a team. Even in conflict, I need to reconcile, not just because he's my husband, because he's my best friend and he's my confidant. In chapter six, she goes to pursue. And again, it's beautiful because they do, both do it. I mean, how ridiculous it can be sometimes, the little games that we play when we get in a fight. I've done nothing wrong. I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to make the first move. I, don't, I shouldn't have to. And then your spouse is saying the same thing. And in the end, you're acting, honestly, like a couple of junior high kids. So congratulations. Because of that, you will have no resolution. And the reality is when we're acting that way, we have an unhealthy marriage. Until you consider your spouse more important than yourself and consider the oneness of your marriage as top priority as you stand before God, not any particular fight, until it's about, not, not, not about you winning, it's going to get worse. And by the way, just a reminder for everyone here, it's a rare conflict that one person holds all the blame. The two most powerful words in all a marriage is, I'm Sorry. Then in this chapter, I just got to fly through it because of time, so I'm not going to read all the verses. In verse 1 through 3, she goes to reconcile. But because of that, look where it brings him. As she reconciles, verse 5 through 7, it says, Turn my eyes from me, they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Gilead. Your teeth like a flock of sheep coming from the washing. Each has its twin, not any of them are alone. Does anyone recognize this? If you were here last, last week, it's exactly how he describes her on her honeymoon. In the middle of a fight, this is what he says. Because they're handling it with godliness, it brings their, his, their first love back. Verse eight through 10, the relationship's coming back to life. They describe springtime. In fact, in verse 11, she says this. I went down to the grove of the nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley to see the vines have budded, the pomegranates were in bloom. And in a sense, it's a question. It's kind of like, hey, we've had this ordeal. Are we still okay? And the description is it's life-giving. Even after conflict, this relationship is life-giving. And in verse 12, great imagery being used. He says, before I realized it, my desire set among me the royal chariots of my people. He's standing there looking at the goodness. He says, absolutely. So with uh, a, the, the few minutes that I have left, uh, let me quickly run through and give you some practical, just kind of sidesteps to conflict. Number one, you need to learn how to respond, not react. Is that an easy thing to do? It is very difficult to, to respond as the Holy Spirit. So let me give you some encouragement. None of us can do it without the Holy Spirit. This comes from a daily passionate walk with Jesus Christ. It's like if, you know, if Mike Trout is a famous baseball player, great hitter, he gets up to the plate and the guy starts to pitch and he throws a fastball, a curveball, and he responds quickly and he hits a home run. But you have to, when it, as soon as it's pitched, he never thinks about it. He just responds. How? Hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. The same is true here. If you think you're going to be nominal in your faith, you know, come to church, you know, twice a month, and that's basically all you do, and then on a Wednesday afternoon in a fight, respond in the Holy Spirit, it's not going to happen. It happens by spending regular, intimate time with the Lord so that in the moment, you respond as you've practiced. Secondly, keep the conflict between the two of you. It actually comes from verse 13. Uh, he talks to the daughters of Jerusalem, her friends, and it's about this dance called the Mo. Hanum, which two people would do in front of a crowd, and he's saying, I know that you've seen this conflict, and maybe you've been involved in it a little bit, but now we're going to get away. This is between the two of us. Listen, you can use counselors. That can be very healthy. Maybe even at a time or two, prayerfully talk to a, a friend to get maybe some advice, but never use friends, family, especially kids, 
in conflict. It just wreaks havoc on relationships. Thirdly, passionately pursue oneness in your marriage. You are on the same team. You have to look at it. If one of you loses, you both lose. You know, if you're a great at yelling and arguing and you demolish her in an argument, you win the argument, but she's crushed, you need to understand you lose. Which means at times you might have to sacrificially give up something that you desire personally and that in godliness that you would really work hard to see another person's perspective. Number four, don't be historical. If you've had a fight in the past that you've actually worked through and resolved and then you get in a new one, don't bring it up again. Because all you're doing is emphasizing the fact that if we reconcile and we say I'm sorry and I forgive you, then I'm still holding on to it. I haven't really moved beyond it. And so when you reconcile, when you move forward, let it go. Number five, and this is just a huge one, but it's a simple statement that needs to be said, never yell in marriage. Honestly, once you start yelling, it's over. Nothing good will come out of it. Proverbs 18 says, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. And when you begin to yell, it's like a city under attack. The walls go up. I don't know what is in us that we think that, oh, now if I start yelling and I throw my fists up and I get really loud, that all of a sudden they're finally going to say, oh, now that you say it that way, <laughs> I, I see your point. Never going to happen. Never. Even when you yell, because you probably will have time or two, just, just time out, let's get away, let's calm down so we can discuss the issue. And then lastly, initiate reconciliation early and often. I talked about this in the very beginning. It's kind of like a backyard. You know, it, it, great marriages, every marriage still needs maintenance. You go in your backyard, and if you do it on a weekly basis, it's manageable. Even though there might be a big project here or there, it's still manageable. But if you don't touch your backyard for two, three years, and all of a sudden you walk back in there, and you're like, oh my gosh, what a mess. The temptation is, I'll just find another house. And that can happen in marriage. Deal with it early and often. Even small sparks of conflict. Sit down and with godliness and the Holy Spirit, respond to one another. I'm sure you heard the old saying, you know, you can win the battle but lose the war. Here, you can win 10 fights in a row, but because of how you handle it, you might lose a marriage. Father God, thank you so much for who you are and what you have done in and amongst us. Lord, I would just pray for the marriages in the room. This is just a quick look at conflict. Many of us probably need a bit deeper look at this maybe read a book or two, have a conversation with a counselor, whatever it is, so that we can begin to put uh, into practice some tools that you have given us to respond well. We're all going to have conflict in friendships, in parenting, in marriage, all going to have conflicts. But Lord, help us be responders, driven by the Holy Spirit, coming out of our personal life with you, not reactors of the flesh. Lord, protect our marriages, I pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, hey, God bless you. Hope to see you next Sunday as we conclude our series looking at deepening.